Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I am Mark Zezza, Director of Policy and Research at the New York State Health Foundation. Uh, for today's conversation, we'll be focusing on the upcoming flu season and how our public health leaders have adapted their flu prevention work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we will answer questions such as, how can we make the flu vaccine as freely uh, um, and widely available as the COVID-19 vaccine? Which communication strategies have proven to be most effective during the pandemic to combat vaccine hesitancy? And could mandates be an effective tool for increasing flu vaccination? But before we jump into the conversation though, let me review a few housekeeping items. First, we will be recording this webinar. Also a recap with a link to the recording and other materials will be circulated afterwards. Video and audio, audio are also disabled for attendees, but we invite you to use the chat box throughout the event to share questions. I will try to work in questions from the audience throughout the discussion, so please do not hesitate to submit them at any time. Now I'd like to, uh, now I'd like to introduce our speakers today, uh, if, if my dog will, will allow that to happen. Uh, but we are very fortunate to have key players at the forefront of New York City's public health efforts to limit the spread of the flu, COVID, and other spreadable and uh, deadly diseases uh, with us today. You know, first up is Dr. Jane Zucker, who is the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Immunization in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, we're also joined by one of her colleagues, Angela Soto, who, who is a city research scientist for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I'm actually gonna ask uh, the two of our guests uh, to talk more about what, what they do and their roles as it relates to the flu. But let me first say that I often hear about how people in public health uh, can save a lot of lives. You know, in fact, I, 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 I'm married to an emergency medicine doctor and I hear her and, and several of her friends who, who uh, you know, they often save lives on a daily basis as part of their jobs, but they describe that, you know, people in public health as being the real heroes that are working to keep, you know, very large populations of people safe uh, you know, on a daily basis. And in New York City, that means millions of people. So let me start off by saying thank you on behalf of everyone for your efforts, you know, especially during which um, you know, I imagine this has been a time that's been very busy and stressful over these last 19 months. Um, so we should have a very uh, interesting conversation and you know, thank you again for, for making some time to, to dis discuss these issues with us today. Um, so let's start off with a, our Q&A with an easy one. Uh, you know, I ask both of you to please describe uh, what you do in your roles for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And Jane, can you lead us off? Sure, so one, thank you very much for having us. We're really pleased uh, to be participating in today's webinar. I will say, I, I think my job is easier than actually having to work, you know, being, being in an emergency department during the pandemic. Um, I can't imagine being anything more stressful except maybe being an intensive care unit physician. <laughs> um, so really kudos to all of the um, medical personnel who are, you know, caring for patients during, during the pandemic. Um, so I do oversee the Bureau of Immunization activities. So, you know, that includes the full range of immunizations across the lifespan. So we have a very active program uh, for flu vaccination for, you know, targeting pediatrics. And a lot of that has to do with distribution through uh, the Vaccines for Children program, as well as immunization registry tools we have to help providers um, no, identify and notify um, their patients who, who need vaccination. Um, we also do a lot of work around promoting adult vaccination um, through various, whether it's through the provider community, through various community-based organizations, and, and as well as um, with the campaign um, that we you know that we do every year um, to make sure the public is aware of where they can get a, a, a flu vaccine. And that's my side job. You know, lately during during the day, I'm, I'm um, overseeing the vaccine operation center for COVID vaccine dis distribution. Um, and planning with providers as well. <laughs> um, thank you, Jane. That, that will help set up a lot of uh, questions for further in the discussion. And 
Angela, I know you also have an important role, but with a slightly different uh, perspective. So please, can you describe what you do at the uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene? And, and I see that you're actually at, at work at a, a, a key site right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And I form part of Dr. Zucker's team in this um, uh, ICS emergency response. Uh, on my non my non-COVID work is Director of Community Health Promotion in the Division of Disease Control. And again, um, just feeling super privileged to be working um, as part of this team and in this role right now. And as you mentioned, yes, I my reporting location um, in this response is um, also to assist with coverage at our New York City vaccination sites. I uh, report to the Queens location in Elmhurst and uh, really form part of a team. So I have the privilege of being here, but ultimately part of a very large team that um, makes this city run and uh, also provides vaccines, not just flu vaccines, but COVID-19 vaccines to New York City residents. Great, thank you, Angela. It's gonna be uh, nice to have your like true on the ground uh, experience to, to, to talk uh, uh, through some of these issues today. Uh, so let's dive right into some of the key issues with respect to the upcoming flu season. And, and, um, and I think to do that, it'll actually be a good idea to start with last year's flu season. Um, you know, last fall, there was a lot of talk about a twindemic, uh, you know, in other words, a second surge of the COVID-19 pandemic co-occurring with the flu season. Uh, a, a bad flu season could have overwhelmed hospitals that were already stretched, uh, thin, caring for COVID-19 patients. Uh, thankfully, New York State experienced a dramatically less severe flu season uh, last year than, than expected. Uh, can you explain what factors might have contributed, contributed to the mild flu season last year? Maybe Jane, can, can you start? Sure. So, I mean, this was a really unprecedented flu season, really the lowest activity since um, CDC started, you know, doing flu influenza surveillance, you know, and I, I think what we've learned about influenza it, and not surprisingly, it is a respiratory virus and, you know, spread through, through droplets. And so all of the precautions that were taken to avoid um, COVID-19 spread, for example, the masking, social distancing, hand washing, um, no social gatherings, people were working from home, you know, all of that really, um, you know, everyone believes really contributed um, to minimizing influenza transmission as well. Great. And, and I and, and definitely want to also talk about, uh, you know, increases in flu vaccination, uh, which, uh, you know, flu vaccination, we all know is the best way to prevent uh, getting the flu. Uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, I believe the flu, flu vaccination rates were actually pretty high last year. Can you tell us, um, you know, how much higher maybe they were last year uh, than in previous years and, and um, you know, why that may have been? Yeah, sure. So uh, one for, we have, um, and I think this may be important for your audience just to set the stage, because um, New York State has an immunization information system, NISIS, and for the city, we have the citywide immunization registry, and we both get pediatric immunizations, um, and adult vaccination had required consent, but um, due to the pandemic, it was actually required for providers to also report along with COVID-19 vaccines, but also report influenza. So we had perhaps some better data as well. But for the adult side, we did see actually a 36% increase in the number of doses that were actually administered and reported to the registry. So that's a huge number. It's hard, we can't sort of um, compare that to what coverage was because we don't, it, that's not population-based. Um, but we did see this large surge in, in adult vaccination, which was really fantastic. And I'm certainly hoping to replicate that this year. Um, I will say on the pediatric side, we actually had a small decrease um, in, in influenza vaccinations. And I think in part, um, not again, I think for your audience, you know, we had vaccination was really quite high. And, and then we hit, you know, our second wave in, in New York City. And, and um, you know, vaccinations really slowed um, after that. Great. And Angela, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what was being done, you know, in, in the communities to, uh, you know, increase the demand for for vaccination, you know, particularly within 
the, the adult population that we saw such a, a huge increase last year. Definitely. I think it's important to note that unlike the COVID-19 vaccine, really in, in the rollout and the planning process, uh, the flu vaccine had a built infrastructure that we could leverage. Uh, and we had spaces throughout New York City where we can refer individuals to um, get their flu vaccine. So I think in that regard, a huge difference between a COVID-19 vaccine rollout and a flu vaccine uh, in terms of the amount of access or access points available. And for those areas that had low coverage, meaning low access points, uh, we had a community vaccinating team that was readily deployed or deployable rather um, to these locations. So in addition to, I think many of the things that we're gonna talk about later on is, is really leveraging a built um, infrastructure to deliver a flu vaccine. Yeah, if I may um, add to, to what Angela said, we were using flu also as a sort of planning tool for COVID-19 vaccination. So for example, we had partnerships with federally qualified health centers mm -hmm. where we conducted, um, you know, and helped support community events on weekends, sort of as a sort of mass clinic in a way so that they can, um, you know, review their protocols and procedures and sort of get the processes in place that they would need for when there was a COVID-19 vaccine available. And also um, for the city, we, we have a community health survey that's done every year. And um, it's similar, people may be familiar with BRFIS on the behavioral risk factor um, sentinel surveillance system. And it's sort of modeled on that program. And it, but out we do 10,000 households and what it does is it gives us enough granular data at the city level. So we can pinpoint which neighborhoods have lower influence, you know, low, lower flu vaccine coverage. And so that's some of the work um, that we would do with Angela is really look at those low coverage neighborhoods and look where, and look at how many flu access points do they need additional, you know, um, sites? Do we need to deploy teams there to offer a vaccine? So let's start, uh, I guess, maybe pivoting and, and looking forward to, to this year's flu uh, season. Um, you know, since we had a, a lower, uh, um, uh, incidents of, of flu last year, you know, what, what does that mean for, for this year's flu season? Like, uh, you know, would we expect like a, a, a bigger like rebound in the flu or, you know, might that mean you'll be more likely to have, have a lower incidence this year? Yeah, so I, I'll say I'm, I'm worried, you know, and we've certainly heard it in the news because this year we're not we don't have the same level of masking, social distancing, people um, are back on mass transit, people are back at work. Um, so a lot of those uh, measures that really would have diminished influenza transmission before are no longer in place. So I think the expectation is that we are gonna have a flu season this year. And, um, you know, we, those of us who, who've been around, we always know, you know, every flu season is different, flu season is, um, really, really unpredictable, um, but certainly there are concerns that it, it could be a much, you know, that it will be a flu season and, you know, concerns that it could be severe. Now, Angela, are you, um, I don't know if it, how early it is, maybe it's too early in the flu season to hear this, but I'm just wondering, like, do you have any sense from being on the ground and in, in the community for, um, you know, the, uh, do you see like this, the same levels of uh, anticipation of getting flu shots or, um, you know, demand that, that that's brewing in, in, in the neighborhoods? I think for the several, it, it, for the several events that we've already conducted in the community in partnership with uh, the same community partners and stakeholders that we did last year, we are seeing the demand. I think that it is requiring on our end to do a lot more education, more than we did last year by comparison, for example. So really teasing out um, what is COVID-19 uh, versus flu. Uh, that is a lot more work than, than we did last year. And um, similarly, almost preempting um, the work. So if we have an event scheduled for uh, a Saturday, going there a week prior or days prior to just table and let people know um, and educate 
um, especially if we are about to have an event, just so that people have the idea or the understanding that we're not there for the COVID-19 vaccine and we can point them to locations to obtain their COVID-19 vaccine, but that we will be there for a flu vaccine. Right. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, you described some of the things that were done last year to, to help ensure people could get access to, to the flu vaccine or is the Department of Health and, and Mental Hygiene, you know, basically going to be doing all of the same things this year or are there, there are more things that they will be doing? In terms of our community engagement work, yes, it's very similar um, to last year's work. Uh, perhaps maybe the only thing that's slightly different is that we are starting a little slower this year, or this time around, rather. Uh, and we are noting that um, our system that we've leaned on, so like big box pharmacies to provide um, more community-based uh, flu vaccination events, and our healthcare system, our staff, is more taxed this time around um, because the focus has been around COVID-19 vaccine. So I, I, that would probably be the significantly or qualitatively different um, uh, barriers that we're facing this time around. Right, and I, I guess maybe this question could be for either of you, just wondering, uh, you know, last year there was the, the twindemic, um, you know, how might the communication strategies, you know, be changed this year? You know, I know there's still so much going on with uh, COVID and, you know, booster shots and, you know, different age groups being eligible for, for COVID vaccines. And um, so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling there, but, you know, so, so how would communication strategies be different this year than last year? Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of start. I mean, we have launched some of our ads. So we, we are, we do have a big media campaign. So we have a media campaign that's a flu focused and also, um, and it, it actually brings in the COVID message in the sense of, you know, I've gotten, you know, I've gotten the flu, you know, I've gotten through the pandemic, you know, I'm not gonna get flu now. And, you know, the importance of, of vaccination. And some of our other ads are really saying how important it is to be protected against both and just trying to distinguish that there are two different vaccines, you know, that you that you need. But I think that is another layer of a, of a challenge. And I, I, well, I want to talk more about, you know, the interaction between COVID and the flu a little later, but just you know, since we're kind of on the topic now, uh, should people be concerned about getting the vaccines around the same time or, or, or what's like the recommend, recommendation for, for doing both of the vaccines? Yeah, so people can get that, both vaccines at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, fortunately we know many, many New Yorkers across the, the city and the, and the state have gotten um, their primary series of COVID-19 mm -hmm. vaccine. Um, so really, we want people who are unvaccinated to get that, to get, you know, start the vaccine series, and they can absolutely do it at the same time as, as a flu vaccination. And, and the CDC has come out with that specific recommendation um, that they can be given at the same time. And that's also true if there are people who need boosters, you can get your booster um, and your flu vaccine. They should be, you know, perhaps you can do one in each arm. You know, or if you're doing, uh, you don't want both arms sore, you can sort of at least separate them out, you know, by about an inch in your muscle if you want the same arm, um, depending upon which vaccines and, and how um, some of them make your arm redder and sore, like for where you would administer it. But much better to get them, get them at the same time than it's only one visit, one visit to the clinic, one visit to the pharmacy. I know uh, a lot of us New Yorkers will appreciate that as, as we love to be efficient uh, with our time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what remain, you know, some of the, some of the large, largest barriers in terms of getting more people, you know, vaccinated against the flu? If I may, Mark, um, oh. I know that you mentioned, yeah, I, I want to come back a little bit to oh. the part that you before we respond to that question mm -hmm. on some of the messaging strategies that oh that have worked or, or, or are working is, I think one thing that we definitely learned as a result of this pandemic is to strengthen those feedback loops. So those of us that are doing the work on the ground is to have like that pulse, that, that pulse or have that ear to the ground that we are able to then uh, report this back up 
to our um, information or communications units so that they develop the messaging either via the presentations that we deliver on a regular basis, community-based presentations, and then also inform our messaging, right? So almost having this like ongoing, almost real-time feedback loops in, in learning what we're hearing on the ground and then being able to then produce messaging to counter that. And that was definitely an ask that we had ongoing come from our community partners and community members. And sorry, I just wanted to, I couldn't walk away without sharing that important um, tool that I think that we have definitely learned from and then perhaps other jurisdictions or other community partners can definitely try to implement. It's not easy, but definitely needed. Yeah, we had a sort of rapid response team almost for some of the COVID misinformation. Uh, and so we had that loop to really come back and try to address any of the concerns that we started hearing that were bubbling up. And then also, I think one thing that is um, perhaps also different this year is the relationships with many more community-based organizations that um, were really brought into the COVID vaccination work with helping to promote um, vaccination for their constituents. And really we're now I'm starting to layer in the flu messaging as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that goes to the trusted messengers. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what's really been, been critical for both COVID-19 vaccination promotion and it is um, equally important for flu. Uh, yeah, and I uh, know, thank you, Angela, for uh, you know, bringing these points, uh, helping to bring these points back up. And you know, it's, I can imagine, uh, you know, it definitely seemed like uh, almost every day during the pandemic, there were major shifts in you know what we understood about the pandemic and uh, you know the types of misinformation that were out there. So I can imagine that there had to be a lot of uh, feedback looping and uh, uh, you know mid-course corrections in the strategies. So that, so that's a really great uh, point. Uh, and also, just I guess before getting into the the barriers question again, I do want to remind people to um, you know feel free to to go ahead and. Uh, chat in some questions and you know we'll, we'll start working in some questions from the audience as as we go through uh, great I see some uh, coming in already uh, so uh, just you know again what remains some of the largest barriers you know we kind of talked a little bit about some of them in terms of uh, you know misinformation and, and trust having a trusted voice uh, but you know what are some of the other you know large barriers um, or you know maybe even new barriers this year relative to, to last year and getting more people vaccinated against the flu yeah. So um, I can start, Angela, and then if you want to um, kick in, you know, I am worried that, you know, last year we told people how important their flu shot is, and then we didn't have much influenza, you know, so I am worried, you know, that people will sort of say, oh, you know, well, you know, why should I worry this year? You know, there wasn't flu activity um, last year that often tends to um, influence, you know, we've seen that influence people's uh, decisions. So I'm, I'm a bit worried about that. I'm worried on the provider side, you know, Angela touched on this earlier, just that there's more limited capacity um, because, you know, we still have, you know, elevated number of cases of, of COVID-19. So, you know, medical facilities are busy, plus they're doing all the flu vaccine work and, you know, like uh, COVID-19 vaccine work and layering in flu. She mentioned sort of, you know, the, um, the pharmacies are doing aren't as available for some of those um, outreach events. So I think that's one, you know, one set of concerns. Um, and Angela can maybe speak. We do a lot of work with um, to really um, ensure access for communities that may not otherwise have access. For example, who may be undo undocumented um, and may not have have health insurance. So um, I think those are really interesting. Um, projects, if Angela, you'd, you'd like to sort of uh, describe some of that work. Yeah, and, uh, and certainly before, thank you, Jane, before touching on the barriers that we are facing now around um, individuals who maybe are, are uninsured, underinsured, or due to documentation status, for example, is um, some of the partnerships that we definitely developed or strengthened even um, during the COVID-19 response. And this is prior to to having the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine is the partnerships with consulates. So really thinking outside of the box on about who or which partners we haven't really developed 
or strengthen these relationships with, um, especially partners that maybe work with the most underserved communities and then um, strengthening that or building these new relationships. So then coming back to the barrier that we are seeing now is how to make um, no cost flu vaccine um, and mirror um, no cost COVID-19 vaccine um, and access points. And I think that is a, that is a little bit of a challenge, um, particularly now that we are leaning or we're not able to lean on big box pharmacies, for example, like Dwayne Reed Walgreens uh, and other locations that last season offered no cost flu vaccine, especially for the uninsured or individuals that um, lack U.S. issue documentation. Right, yeah, thank you, Angela, for, for uh, you know, bringing up some of those points. And it kind of raises another question in my mind that I, I hear from folks all the time where you know, they, they may go to a CVS or the uh, or, you know, urgent care and kind of expect not to pay anything at all for um, you know, the, the, the visit to get the flu vaccine, uh, but sometimes they get charged. So I don't know, like they, even when they have insurance, uh, you know, this, this may come as a surprise to folks. So can, can you describe like why this may happen? Um, and I guess either of you can, can jump in here. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it, it's sort of, a, there's a, a bit of a complicated um, answer. So one, um, I think everyone should know that the, under the Affordable Care Act, um, flu vaccination is, is a covered benefit with, without a copay. Mm -hmm. So for example, if your health insurance uh, and many of them I know in the city do have these close partnerships with the big chain pharmacies that you can walk in and get a get a flu shot and and not have a copay. You know that, that the administration fee is billed to health insurance. You know the the model is different because the urgent cares are not are not your primary care. So there there may be the fee for for obtaining service at you know depending upon what their relationship is with it with. Um, with the insurance plan, but if you go to your primary care doctor, again, they can't charge you a copay for that, for their flu, for the flu vaccine. But if you're having an office visit, you're having your regular sort of doc, you know, annual checkup, they can charge you the copay for the annual checkup. So, but not the flu vaccine. So that's where it gets um, a little bit confusing. But there's, there really are, and we have many places across the city where there's either no cost or low cost flu, flu vaccines based on sliding scale for people um, who otherwise don't have a, a primary care provider or um, don't have insurance. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for helping to clarify that a bit. And, and you know, folks probably sh should not be afraid to, to push back a little bit, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, that, that if they do have a charge that it is an appropriate charge because, you know, I definitely have heard of some, some folks being charged uh, inappropriately as well. And, uh, yeah, Jane, you had mentioned that you know there are there are some places uh, you know that that the city's you know making available to get flu shots. I don't know if there's a uh, a specific you know website that you guys want to like plug to to make sure you know if, if people are looking for a place where they can get either the flu vaccine or the COVID vaccine that you know that they can find one you know, easily in their neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. So our health department website, and I know you'll be able to put the link at um, nyc gov slash health slash flu. We have all the information and links to the vaccine finder, links to community events. I um, mean, Angela's put our vaccine finder website in, in the chat and um, that actually is used for COVID and for flu. And so people can find convenient location searching for, you know, by vaccine product and, and um, by zip code um, as well. Thank you, Angela, for putting that in the chat. Uh, and we have a few good questions in the chat as well. So I'm going to turn over to those. Right, if I may, oh, Mark, just one thing. So also in New York City, people can call 311. You know, some people may, may, be, um, may be less comfortable with the technology, but we also have a phone system and that's 24 seven. And they translate into like 140 plus languages. So to make sure that we can, we can serve the, our diverse community. So that is another option for people. Awesome. Thank you for that. And a text messaging service, actually, <laughs> as well. Thank you for that reminder about 3 on 1. Um, so, okay, so this question about home is about home, homebound uh, vaccination programs. You know, are, are there any plans to extend the homebound vaccination program for COVID vaccination to include 
the flu vaccine. Uh, we have seniors and others who are homebound and have difficulty obtaining the flu vaccine. All right. So thank you for that question. We're we're looking into whether we can we can do that. There are some uh, restrictions about the providers that we homebound that we're using to do that homebound vaccination, and um, we are looking into it. And we're well aware of some of the the barriers for people who are homebound, um, and and really hoping that um, we'll be able to at least provide some level of of service for that. But that's really um, it's in in the works and under discussion. Mm -hmm. Definitely sounds like an important uh, strategy. Um, so uh, this is uh, another question, should be a quick answer, it seems fairly clinical. I, I know there are two different vaccines, but will one, um, assuming the COVID vaccine, you know, help prevent you know, getting the other if you have both vaccines, COVID and flu? So actually that's a really, really important question and mm -hmm. the answer is no. Mm -hmm. So flu vaccine is gonna only protect you against influenza and the COVID-19 vaccine is only going only to prevent you against COVID-19 infection. And right, they're both respiratory viruses and they both can cause you know, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Very difficult to distinguish the, the two. So it's you know, partly why you, you need both vaccines to prevent against both infections. Great, thank you for clarifying that. So just to be clear, everyone needs both vaccines. Um, uh, okay, so just uh, talking about COVID, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 vaccination campaign has taught us a lot about strategies that work for increasing both access to vaccinations and motivation to vaccinate. Uh, what have we learned about the COVID-19 vaccination effort that could help us increase flu vaccinations? Uh, you know, I think it's a lot of what we have talked about. It's it's working with the community-based organizations. It's working with faith-based organizations, other trusted messages. The work, for example, um, Angela mentioned about consulates. It's the work we're doing with the provider community, making as much information available and making it as easy as possible for people to get to get their flu vaccine. Um, so I think it's all of those pieces that we've been talking about, which will really um, you know, I think it influence um, how well we do for flu this year. And maybe adding one more thing, um, in addition to everything that uh, that Jane mentioned, mentioned is uh, one one important piece is also providing in person language interpretation. So oftentimes we rely on uh, a language line, but we definitely see a difference when we have individuals that speak the language or the most commonly spoken language on site, wherever we are delivering uh, vaccines, flu vaccines and COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for also uh, monitoring the, the chat and answering some of the chat questions. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, another, another thing that gets talked about during, uh, uh, you know, dealing with COVID and, you know, it seems to be helping to increase uh, vaccination rates is, is mandates. Um, you know, government's been thinking about mandates and, uh, employers, schools have been thinking about mandates. Um, you know, can you talk about more about whether you know that 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 would be you know a, a good idea, uh, and if there are other ways that employers or even universities can make the flu vaccine available and promote vaccination? Sure. So actually, I, I'll go back to one thing I said earlier about um, our pediatric vaccination had declined, and and this was actually particularly among um, children who were under five. Uh, where we saw the largest decline over uh, 10 percentage points. Um, in New York City, and this is not true in the rest of the state, but we do have a flu vaccine requirement um, for children up to five years of age um, attending um, in-person childcare. And so, uh, and this would be in the New York City regulated sites. So, you know, last year with children weren't in in-person in daycare. Um, and so they're really, we there was no requirement, right? You couldn't, um, you know, if they're not in class and they, they didn't need to have a flu vaccine. And so that really contributed to a drop uh, in, in coverage. So I, I think that those kind of requirements are really very, very important. So with children back in, in daycare, we're hoping we're gonna see an increase. We actually got 77% of our um, children, six to 59 months um, of age had gotten a flu vaccine the year before. <laughs> So we're really hoping, you know, that 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 vaccination will will increase. So we've seen where those kind of requirements can certainly 
um, improve vaccination. In, in New York State, there is a requirement for healthcare workers working in certain types of facilities, Article 28 sort of hospitals, um, FQHCs and, and other clinic spaces to have, to have a flu vaccine or wear a mask, which is sort of this year everyone can wear, uh, um, has to wear a mask anyway because of COVID, but there are some of those requirements that are in fact in, in place on the healthcare worker side and other requirements to sort of offer flu vaccine for, for example, nursing home staff. Um, but one of the things that we do in the city is we really work with the large employers as well as universities to really help them make available flu vaccine to their, whether it's their employees or, or to their students. You know, and there is evidence showing that Right, it is in their interest to keep their staff healthy, right? And coming to work and, and not getting the flu, but there's a lot that they can do between um, for people, sites where people are either back in class or back in at work, have work site, um, flu vaccination, offer flu vaccination if they have health clinics. And also their policies with their insurers are important. We mentioned, you know, flu vaccine, it, you're making it easy at pharmacies, but those kind of policies are, are really critical. We covered a, a lot of ground there, uh, but we have a really uh, important question in the chat and um, you know, talking about racial disparities uh, and, and vaccination rates. I know here at the foundation, we've looked at uh, you know, other kinds of vaccinations like uh, the, 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 child, the pediatric child series and HPV uh, vaccines and have seen some differences in um, uh, in, in vaccination rates by race and ethnicity. And I'm just wondering, uh, or, or we have a question here, of, you know, what about the flu data, um, um, you know, in particular the last um, you know, year or so, uh, you know, have there been significant racial um, disparities in flu vaccination rates? Um, so yes, there have. And um, I don't know that we can, we did actually have a press release not too long ago that sort of had our flu numbers and, and talked about the racial disparity. What we see with flu vaccine mirrors what we're seeing with COVID-19 vaccination, where, you know, coverage is sort of higher among people who identify as Asian, Pacific Islander, and um, the Hispanic and sort of white coverage is sort of not too far behind, but lower, you know, close, similar. And then coverage among uh, people who are identified as Black New Yorkers have the lowest coverage. Um, so that's actually a big focus of our, our work as well is addressing that disparity. All right, yeah, can you describe some of the uh, like key strategies um, you know, that, that, that might be rolled out to, to help address that? Yeah, sure. So um, I think we're, for example, we work with faith-based organizations as well. Um, especially, um, you know, black churches and, and in neighborhoods where we see that there that there's lower coverage. Those are sites where um, we've done specific outreach events and work with with CBOs in terms of making sure that we can bring bring flu vaccination as well. And you know, working with facilities in, in those areas um, where we advertise, how we advertise in terms of you know radio, newspapers, um, to really reach the community who have um, lower coverage. Uh, Angela, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's a series of sort of different strategies because I think that's one thing that's important. It's never one magic strategy, right? It's generally multiple supporting um, mm -hmm. efforts mm -hmm. and activities that sort of help bring you know bring you to a successful program. And Angela, I see, I, I see you shaking your head throughout that response. I just want to make sure uh, you have a chance to add in anything if if you'd like to. Absolutely. I, I think uh, we can't move forward ever again without addressing equity and um, lack of access to the most underserved. Um, just in addition to what Jane mentioned, are some of the locations that have really um, resulted in, in incredible uptake of vaccines are connecting, again, leaning on our community partners key stakeholders. Food pantries are a great location um, for those individuals, and I'm sure people are doing this, but if, if they're not really um, leveraging those, those spaces. Um, also, um, oh, and I just lost my train of thought, I'm sorry, uh, 
food pantries, certainly uh, faith-based organizations, but really partnering with those um, community partners that serve the populations uh, where we are seeing um, low uptake. And it's gonna take a lot of work, a lot of patience, but ultimately just not giving up and continuing to show up. And I know that doesn't give you concrete examples per se, but um, yeah, everything that Dr. Zucker mentioned, including um, those spaces where individuals that maybe seek um, food, um, mm -hmm. faith-based, and yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, I'll say one example, actually what Angela's reminding me, one of our um, COVID-19 vaccination sites is in an area um, where we're seeing both um, low coverage for flu vaccine and low coverage for COVID-19. And it's, um, it's Brooklyn um, Children's Museum. It, and uh, it, so it's a very popular site, um, you know, for children, for parents. And, and actually it's one site where we're piloting offering flu vaccine at the same time as a COVID-19 vaccine. Go back to that convenience factor right. of making it, making it as easy as possible for people to get, to get both vaccines. So we are piloting um, that, that approach as well. I remember what I wanted to say where I lost my train of thought is um, offering uh, no appointment based or walk up um, access to uh, to vaccines. That is also it was a huge barrier that we certainly saw at the beginning of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Um, and we've been able to to uh, create locations or offer locations, community based locations where an appointment is not needed. Right. And I guess the other thing I'll add, you know, we do have a voucher program um, that we pilot, that we do conduct with one of the um, chain pharmacies. And so that's actually really important for some of the events where we know that there's, um, you know, a large proportion of people who may not have insurance and just knowing that that barrier is removed um, is, uh, is important. And we do work with other facilities across the city um, who are um, providing community-based flu uh, work where we actually will give them flu vaccine um, specifically for people who don't have an insurance to make sure that that's not a barrier for people who are coming to the event. Great. Uh, this is so much good uh, information there in the last you know, few minutes. Uh, and we're, we're just about you know, time for, for the webinar. So I'll, I'll just end things with one question that I, that I, that I usually like to ask uh, you know, at all of these kinds of events to, to our experts. Um, you know, imagine you are in charge of picking the word or words that would go on a billboard that millions of New Yorkers would see. Uh, what would that billboard say? And, you know, you don't even have to limit it to uh, the, the flu. Vaccine save lives. Very good. I don't know if I, Angela, no pressure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Healthcare access is a human right. Very good. Th those seem like uh, perfect uh, notes to, to end on. Um, and and that, that's basically all, all we have time for. So, so thank you again, Jane and Angela, for the super informative discussion. Uh, thank you also to the audience for making the time to join us and to send over some uh, very interesting and, and useful questions. Uh, before signing off, I just want to remind you all that the video recording of today's event will be available along with a link to, uh, um, to some, some, some related documents. And you can also uh, you know, check out the, the New York State Health Foundation website for some you know, related documents uh, um, uh, related to, to uh, vaccinations uh, trends in, in New York. And, and stay tuned for information about our other upcoming events as well. So, Thank you again, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you.